one, how special these grounds are. Um, the other evening, you heard that the, um, the king who uni united the islands actually made this the capital of his kingdom. え、まずえ、開催をさせていただく前にですね、え、このまあ、場所、私たちの今いるこの都内のこのエリアですね。え、昨日もえ、少しばかり、え、情報でここが非常に特別な土地であるということなお話があったと思いますけれども、え、ここ
バックしていただいて<笑>、まあ、そのようなあの素晴らしい、えー、紹介をいただいて、えー、その期待に添えるかどうか分かりませんけれども、えー、頑張ります。So how many have, of you have heard me speak and know my history? 今まで自分のスピーチをあの聞きになってくださった方、手を挙げてください。どれだけいらっしゃったかなと。<笑>えー、えー、ということで、ちょっと私の、まあ、このスピーチ、耐えて、耐え忍んでお聞きいただければと思います。So, um, my background is not in energy or space travel. My, my background is in computer games. <笑>私の,その、なんていうか、背景というのは、あもう科学、えー、そしてそのエネルギーやその宇宙飛行や,そや、そういったことの開発とは全く関係のない、実はコンピューターゲームの、えーまあ、なんていうか、専門なんです。Yeah, I studied computer science at the University of Hawaii in 1984. コンピューター科学を専門にハワイ大学で、えー、勉強いたしまして、そして1984年に、えー、その卒業し、そして、えー、とロールプレインという、えー、ここで日本に参りまして。えー、その後、えー、日本で、まあ、それが第一になったものですから、多分日本での方が私の名前は知れているのではないかなと思いますけれども。All right. So, what changed my life?、Uh, and that happened after I sold my company, or one of my companies.、Uh, this is maybe 12 years ago. And a month after I sold my company, I found myself in the back of an ambulance on the way to the hospital. With a hundred percent blockage of the Widowmaker. You know what that is? The Widowmaker is the largest artery in your heart. そしてそれをした直後にですね、なんとこの大動脈のこの一番その重要な心臓に、えー、行くこの血脈がですね、こう全部塞がってしまうということで、うん、自分は救急車に運ばれて、そして、えー、その 100% もう塞がってしまったという状態で病院に運ばれるということを体験しました。Frankly, if I had been on this island, I would have died that day. でもし、えー、その日、ハワイ島にいたらば、たぶんもうこの世にはいなかったと思います。まあ、それは一つに病院に行くまでの時間がかかるということもありますけれども、えー、そしてそのこのハワイ島にある病院の中では、そのアンジオプラスティというその、まあえー、血動脈を、えー、開く。えー、その病院にさ備えてある施設の,その、えー、機会がないということがありますので、えー、お枠等でいなければ、えー、助からなかったということです。あ<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> First of all, you got to be kidding me. I haven't spent any of the money yet. <laughs> the second thing I thought was、uh, no, I'm not going. I still have stuff to do. So, the Bion and the Kyoto Juni, or 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 the k y o t 自分を鼓舞するそういった思いがこう,あのこうそういろいろと巡っていました。So I obviously survived,、um, and、uh, over the next couple of weeks, I, I deeply thought about my mission in life. えー、そしてまあ当然のことながらこうして今元気になっておりますので、まあ生存しましたけれども、えー、それを機に、えー、深く深く、えー、これから自分のどういうような人生を So the,、uh, the first mission came to me in the back of the newspaper. 
while I was still in the hospital. And it was a small article in the newspaper that said, it's kind of like, oh, by the way, because it's all the way in the back. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, we're going to kill all the coral in the world by the end of the century. So I'm, my background is when I first came to Hawaii, I became a surfer and a diver, and I fell in love with the ocean, and I, I'm still in love with the ocean. So I said, no way, this is not something that we're allowed to do. え、まずそこで思ったことは自分がハワイに来たのはまず海が大好きだ、だからです。サーフィングそしてダイビングなどもう本当に海が大好きで、この島になってきました。え、それは今も変わらずに海の大海が大好きなので、その記事を読んだ
家の人たちに説明をして、えー、そして、えー、こう親というか大人が分かるように説明をしてもらうそういったことから理解を深めてもらうように、えー、努力をしました is not for us because the biggest problem isn't going to happen in our lifetime. It's going to happen in our children's lifetime. でもちろんですけれども、えー、このさまざまな影響というのは、私たちが生きている間、生存中のに起こる問題ではなくて、えー、当然ながら子供たちが、えー、の未来、えー、またその先に、えー、問題が起こるので、えー、私たちが、えー、そういったところで、えー、先駆けてやっていかなければいけない。So we have had、um, uh, many successes in the foundation, but I think our biggest success is that we created a mandate that Hawaii will go 100% renewable by 2045 for electricity. えー、そしてああのブループラネットの方では多くのことを、えー、成し遂げることが、えー、今までにできましたけれども、えー、その中でも一つ一番特筆すべきことは私たちの方で、えー、2045年までに 100% エネルギーを、えー、その私たちの中で持続できる地球持続できるようにするという、えー、宣言を、えー、したことです。But I think the truth is the electric company is going to do it much sooner. <laughs> a few years ago, I was、uh, at a、uh, conference called TED.、Uh, Uh, TED Talks. I don't know how many people. Eh, so then, my TED, the Nihon demo, the Zonjo, the Kaka, 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 えー、そしてすごくあと思ったのはそのプロクラスティネーション要するに変態というか、えー、遅らせる、えー、そういったなんていうかあそのトークを聞いたんですね。Two types of people, one starts right away and one waits until the end the deadline is near then they have to do it. 世の中には二種類の人間がいる。えー、一つは、えー、まあ何かこうやると決めたらもうすぐにやる。ですけれども、もう一つは、やっぱりこの締め切りがあったら、もう締め切りまで、試験の当日の前日までということで、もう伸ばしに伸ばしてしまう、その二つのタイプに限られる。What I learned from that talk was that no matter what type you are, if you don't have a deadline, you're never going to get there. そして、そのお話の中から、私が学んだことは、やはり締め切りというものがない限り、どちらにしても、So I was thinking, so I need a deadline. What is my deadline? And there must be somebody at TED smart enough to, to know what the deadline is. So I was thinking, so I need a deadline. 締め切りは自分の締め切りはじゃあいつにしたんだいい,い,いんだろうかということを投げかけました。And I, um, I searched through the talkers and I, I found one talker speaker、um, who I thought must know the deadline and her name is Christiana Figueres、えー。そしてその中の、えー、スピーカーの中の一人でクリスチアナ・アントニア・フィグエラス。フィグエラス。そういう,<笑><笑>う,いうあの方が。えー、そういった名前の方が一人、まあ、自分がその中で、えー、一番この自分が求めているその、えー、締め切りに関して、えー、知,識知識を持っている人だということで探し当てました。If you look at the picture of、uh, the Paris Agreement and all of the leaders of all the countries that agreed to sign the Paris Agreement, you will see Christiana Figueres in the middle because she is the one who made them all agree. Uh, to do the same thing, which is a pretty amazing feat. 
、えー、そしてパリ宣言、えー、ご存知かと思いますけれども、このパリ宣言が、えー、この著念された時の写真をご覧になっていただくと、そのクリスチャンさんが真ん中にいらっしゃいます。というのも、彼女がそのすべての、えー、国々に、えー働きかけて、えー、と5000円が調和、えー、するようにということで、えー、働きか,かけた方なので、まあ、素晴らしい、えーまあ、実行力を持った方ですよね。So I found her and I said, Christiana, my name is Hank Rogers, I have a foundation, I need to end using c a r b o n b a s e d fuel, what's my deadline? ということで、えー、自己紹介をして、もうぜひあのその締め切りを、えー、教えてほしいというふうにお願いしました。And she looked me straight in the face and said, And I was in said, 2020. えー、そして、えー、彼女は自分の目をまっすぐ見て2020年ですと言いました。Anybody, I, 2020年というともうすぐですから、えー、それでえ2045年ということで、えー、とハワイの、えー、と電源会社の方にこう、えーまあまあ、あの一生懸命そういったことで同意してもらうことになったのに2020年というのは非常に早いですから、まあ、本当にあの焦った気持ちがもう<笑>満面したわけです。I, I think that date is not the date where it must end. I think that date is the, the date when we must tip. That must be the tipping date. 多分その2020年という彼女の、えー、言った年というのは、多分そ,のそれまでにということではなくて、その加工気味になるその一番の、えー、加工する、えー、急加工する年が2020年でなければならないという、えー、年だというふうに理解をしていますけれども。So the bottom line is,、uh, we started on this, we knew that we were going to have to do all of this in the 1970s when Governor Ariyoshi said, let's make Nelha to solve these problems.、えーまあね、And we are now, 30 years later, going, oh my god. We have to finish this in the next three or four years. So we're the procrastinators. So, you could have been, well, 30 years ago, you could have been, well, 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 you Um, if, the, if we all woke up today, I mean, when I say we all, meaning everybody on the planet, and all said, yes, we have to do something about it in the next three years, we could. In the beginning of World War II, Uh, Franklin Roosevelt said to Detroit, You're not making any more cars. You're making planes and tanks. That's it.、えー、so, the second time, the second time, the first 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 time, the 私たちも同じようなことができるのではないかと思います。So、Detroit, なので私たちはデトロイトの、えー、車工場に向かって、要するにその水素や、えー、電気の車だけ製造するようにしなさいというふうに命令をしなければいけないです。I have some new dates for Hawaii. えー、なのでハワイにおいては新しい、えー、日付を、えー、掲げます。Are you listening, Jay? Hey, Jay, son. You hear me? I'm going to tell you that you did it. No more internal combustion engine cars sold in Hawaii by 2025. Eh, there are this, eh, to some internal combustion, so, soon, the car, no, eh, the engine, or, start, or, the car, or, eh, 2025, no, eh, the, eh, the, eh, the, Norway has already done this. They said no more,、uh, no, only electric and hydrogen cars after 2025. 2025 
、もう水素、そして、えー、電気だけに、えー、頼った車を、えー、しか走らないということです。そしてオランダももちろんそれに続いて、えー、ぜひ、えー、やろうというふうに話をしています。なので、えーとまあ、国々が、えー、世界に向けてそういったことを私たちが発信していけば、えー、当然そのように、えー、皆さんもならないので、ぜひそういうふうにしなければいけないというふうに。And I'll give Jay another, another five years of 2030. And by the way, I think you're already on that path, right? <laughs> Big Island is easy, but you know, Oahu is a. ハワイ島はまだ大丈夫だと思いますけれども、オアフ島がもうちょっと難しいかもしれませんね。And, uh, jet fuel by 2035. それから飛行機の燃料を2025年までには、えー、と買える、ジェットフィールドを、えーと。We went in World War II, we went from biplanes to jet planes in five years.、えーまあ、第二次世界大戦の時には、ジェットの前にバイプレーンというあですね。It's a plane with two wings. あ、2枚そのこの飛行機です。<笑>そういう飛行機から戦闘機からえっ、ー、とジェット機の、えー、戦闘機にもう4年で、えー、もう変換することができたので、もうこれは間違いなくそういったことがもうできるというふうに確信しています。そしてその4年かけ、うんうんまあ、第2次大戦の,その4年間の間に、えー、その原爆も4年間で作るという、なのでやればできるということですね。So、is, really なので、本当に本気でやる気を起こせば、絶対にできるというふうに思っています。And it's up to us to wake everybody else up and make sure that we're on that same path. なので私たちの責任はみんなが同じ方向を目指してそして目を覚ましてその方向に向かって、えー、進むということそれが私たちの、えー、皆さんのこの世界に対して、えー、対する責任だと思います Thank you very much. ありがとうございました何か質問ございますか Don't be scared. Hi. Oh. So, Hank, were you involved with Governor Ige's decision to pass、um, the Green House or adopt the Green House for the state? Yes. The question is, Ige Chi Ji, in terms of the Green House, So, the good news is that I was not directly involved. What that means is that all of our work to change the way Hawaii thinks is now working, and Hawaii is thinking differently all by itself. あの関わっっていなかったつまり、えー、自分の力添えなくハワイはすでにもうそういうことで、えーとあまあえー、いいエネルギー、クリーンな環境に対して、えー、とそういった思考を持って変えようとしていることを自力でそういうふうに、えー、到達することができたということがそれがすごくやっぱり自分が関わらなかったという意味で直接関わっていなかったということで非常に良かったことだと思っています。Come on, I want a question from Japan. もっともっと日本から。I think I understood you to say that you wanted to eliminate emissions from jet fuel by 2030, 2035, something like that. That's a more difficult problem than ground transportation. What's the solution to that?、Um, I'm a computer game designer. <laughs> so, what we do is we put together、uh, a bunch of scientists, the smartest people in the world,、uh, that we can find, put them in a room, don't let them out until they come up with a solution. Uh, it's the next Manhattan project. えー、質問はですね、えーとそのまあえー、その空輸関係の燃料に関しては、もっとあ難しいんじゃないかと、市場のそのエネルギーを変え,変えていくよりも、まあ、そういった意味では、そのえー、マンハッタン計画の時のように、あの今まで、えー、この地上の中にいる頭の頭脳面積の人たちをもうとにかくいっぱい集めて、部屋に
でね、そして解決法が見つかるまでは絶対出さないということで、えー、とにかくあのやれば、なんとかそういったことができるんじゃないかということを思います。えー、それから公共、それから、えー、と商業の、えー、と企業とのコラボレーションというのはどういったところが、えー、できるでしょうか、どこが難しいですか。Well, right now with the situation in Washington, I don't see much collaboration、uh, happening coming out of Washington.、Um, but on the state level, we certainly can. We can set deadlines by beginning like 2045 or 2025. We can set deadlines, and that moves the Uh, private sector to change the way they think. Like, for example, the electric company said, We can do this by 2040, which is like, wow, that's amazing. まあ、そういったことで政府レベルでは今の状況では多分無理だと思いますけれども、州レベルではいろいろとそういったことで、えー、と自分たちが州として動いたこと、結果がその公共の、えー、と団体、ハワイ電気ですとか、そういった皆さんを、えー、こう変えて、えー、流れを変えることは可能なのではないかという、そういったコラボは可能だと思います。But if you look back on, on World War II, both in Japan and in the US, the, the changes that the ordinary people made to their own lives.、Uh, Basically, pushed the countries to be able to do what they did back then. And、uh, that is really up to us also as individual people on the private sector to actually say, well, we're not going to do this anymore. 要するに戦時中のことを考えますと、アメリカも日本もそうですけれども、まあ、一般市民の人たちが、えー、何かの,その掲げた、えー、そのものに向かって、あれだけの努力をして、その市民の力でいろいろさまざまなことが大きく変動していったということがあるので、そういったことを考えれば、えー、と同じようなことが、えー、とできるのではないかと思います。And that means that the rest of us are going to have to do it anyway. ということで、日米とも、えー、と政府が全くそういった意味ではあの全く、まあ、理解していない、この問題に関して、なので、どういうことがどういうことかというと、私たちが、えー、一般市民が、えー、何とか頑張らなければいけないというふうに考えています。ありがとうございます。はい、それでは明日お時間がある方と、あえー、とこちらのランチの方で、牧場の方でお待ちしております。えー、本当にありがとうございます。The ranch is 100% off the grid, so we're already 100%、えー。牧場の方はですね、もう 100% あのオフグリッドですので。And I drive electric cars, so my ground transportation is 100%. えー、そしてあ牧場あの地域内は、えー、全部すべて、えー、車は電気車です。なので皆さんでもできますよ。そんな難しくありません。どうもありがとうございました。Translation. So, what we're going to do is, those of you that need、uh, English translation, we're going to ask you to sit together so that the translators can、uh, work there and ask everybody that、uh, can speak English to move to the center. <笑>それではですね、えー、昨日の、えー、前例に、えー、伴いまして。あのまあ、通訳が入,るの入りますと、やはり、えー、祝日通訳です時間がかかりますので、ベルトを着て、えー、やるために、えー、皆さん、英語で、えー、分かる方は、この真ん中のテーブル席に座っていただいて、えー、通訳が必要な方は、えー、この申し訳ないですけども、移動していただいて、えー、この横の方に移、ね、動していただけますでしょうか。
beginning to happen uh, among Hawaii leaders, both at the county level and at the state level. And one of the contributing factors was that back in September, we hosted the largest, uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And uh, you had 10,000 people from 190 countries convening in our world. And uh, these topics of renewable energy, clean energy, were at the forefront. And um, I think that did a lot to accelerate the learning curve uh, here locally about the international momentum that's gaining around these issues. You know, while we're enjoying this particular workshop, it's time to also reflect and look back at the past uh, gatherings that uh, many of you have attended. So at this time, I'd like to ask Mr. Yasuyuki Ishigami, who is the Deputy Director and Professor in the Institute of Ocean Energy at Saga University. Hello, hi, hi, hi. Uh, As you know, uh, this world is uh, uh, born from the workshop. This world is uh, made by the guy -san. So, uh, as a start of beginning the, this workshop, so we are joined uh, Mr. Guy. Uh, Mr. Guy. So, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our achievement in this workshop uh, with guy -san. This, uh, this workshop is the mission of the Ocean Summer Energy Conversion Work. This workshop, uh, the mission of the Ocean Summer Energy, uh, Ocean Summer Energy Conversion Working Group of the Hawaii Okinawa Clean Energy Corporation is a facilitate facilitate the implementation and the advancement of the effective OTEX system uh, at the start beginning. So, as you know well, uh, Ireland has a uh, ocean energy character characteristic. Uh, Ireland uh, is a limited area and uh, limited energy. So, next stage we have to use the uh, renewable energy. So as you know, we have already uh, realized the wind and solar energy, so uh, we have to uh, accelerate the ocean energy. So uh, ocean energy potential is a very high potential. It's a recognized uh, potential of ocean energy. It's a very large world, uh, worldwide. This is a reported IEA, International Energy Association. So I have... Uh, So, uh, OTEC is expected as a base load. And the ability to scale up the capacity and the visual plant. So, and uh, very little onshore uh, space available. So, uh, and uh, uh, utilization of the cold energy, deep sea or uh, low air conditioning load and uh, daytime energy consumption. Uh, so, uh, history of the cooperation. So, uh, this uh, cooperation signing, the, uh, as you know, uh, June to 2010 and renewed to 2015. So, uh, seven years annual conference and uh, sister city relationship and uh, two unique yet close related projects and growing international interest. And uh, we have a uh, very uh, important 100 kilowatt facility we have. So, uh, OTEC 
and the US and Japan. Historically, OTEC R&D has leaded by both countries internationally. So, uh, first, uh, first boom, the 2018. So, both country has a uh, uh, net power generation experience. And OTEC and Hawaii, Okinawa, so uh, temperature of the sea water in both regions is suitable for the OTEC implementation. So, first, this uh, workshop, DOE proposed to discuss the possibility of the implementing OTEC with a corporate framework. So, uh, to discuss the contribute of the implementation to the building and promoting the island model. So, uh, after signing uh, the METI, DOE, Okinawa Prefecture, and Hawaii signing MOU, so uh, we are started the uh, Ocean Energy work, Working Group uh, and formed based on the suggestion from the uh, US DOE. So, first Ocean Energy Workshop before the started Kumejima uh, 2010. Very historical photo. So after that, unfortunately, a great uh, East Japan aspect, very aspect. So uh, Kumeji uh, advanced the deep sea water uh, facility using. So uh, we are complete the Kumeji model proposed of the cascade use the deep sea water. So uh, 2011. So NATO uh, started uh, the ocean energy project. So after that, uh, we start, uh, hold the uh, second ocean uh, work workshop in Kona. So uh, during the, this workshop, so, uh, Kumejima town and Hawaii county uh, becomes a sister city. At times, uh, Hawaii a uh, large scale OTT exchange study uh, started this one. Already started for the heat exchange. So, uh, 2011, Nelha began a uh, request for the interest towards the 1 megawatt OTT. And 20, uh, 2020, uh, 12, Okina Prefecture began the power generation utilization demonstration project of, uh, of the sophisticated use deep sea water, OTEC demonstration facility construction, 100 kilowatts plus on the Kumejima data. So next we, uh, we hold the third uh, workshop in Kumejima with Gai san. So we are keep that this is a uh, our body. So, uh, Empire and uh, to uh, visit uh, Okinawa deep sea or facilities. Unfortunately, uh, 2012 is the passing of the guy. So, uh, 20 is uh, uh, 13, started Okinawa OTEC demonstration facility power generation. So, uh, the first uh, operation the, on the second room. So, fourth uh, ocean, uh, ocean energy workshop uh, is Kona. Uh, at, at this year, the uh, uh, first international OTEC symposium uh, hold in Hawaii. The French and Korea co main company announced a roadmap for the development of OTEC. Uh, 20, uh, 2014 announced the French uh, France DCNS and Aqua Energy will be uh, received funding from the e EU uh, Foundation of the about 100 million US dollars for the one megawatt OTEC 
project. So, uh, middle of next stage uh, of this pro demonstration uh, project started uh, with uh, Japan Marine United and Southern University. So, uh, fifth ocean energy workshop for the Kumejima. So many visitors, uh, uh, we, we, can, we could introduce the uh, OTEC generation. So uh, this year, uh, we are organized, uh, supported by uh, NEDO uh, as a renewable energy workshop. Next, after that, uh, we hold the sixth ocean energy workshop at Kona. So uh, in this workshop, so Makai 105 kilowatt world largest uh, OTEC power generation. Uh, we hold the, uh, they hold the uh, ceremonies. It's against the uh, Ige governor. At this uh, workshop, uh, we we are signing uh, a cooperation agreement on the development of the, of the OTEC was entered into the related companies, the university. Uh, Neruha, Japan Marine United, Makai, Genesis Southern University, Yokogawa Electric, and Kobe City. So we are, this team is uh, promoting the uh, uh, actually OTEC system to install the uh, island. So uh, last year, Okinawa government is, uh, started the uh, uh, post OTEC seawater use demonstration after OTEC on Kumeshima. So last year we hold the seventh uh, workshop at Kumeshima. So uh, this uh, workshop expanded the uh, ocean energy symposium and workshop to including OTEC, deep sea use, environment cons consideration and education uh, and keynote by the Dr. Kashiwagi and the vicar of the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. Uh, over the 100 uh, participants. So, oh, last, uh, this year, uh, uh, last year, construction of the post optic deep sea oil for piping for the demonstration in Kumejima. And this year, uh, so, uh, NEDO project installed the 50 kilowatt uh, new turbine and new heat exchanger. So, uh, totally 100 uh, generator installed. So, uh, 2015, uh, Ige Gamada also announced. So, uh, I believe that our country is. Uh, uh, working together really with accelerate the development of the OTEC as a renewable from energy, renewable energy source for the world. So, so uh, this uh, figure shows the Japan OTEC roadmap. So now is uh, uh, operating here, 100 kilowatt. Next, one megawatt class in Kumeshima. Then uh, 10 megawatt plus the offshore tank. So uh, finally 100 megawatt and the commercial plan. So uh, Kumejima project is uh, evaluate and uh, 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 bankable uh, of OTEC. So uh, using a uh, 100 kilowatt uh, extent mental data extend to one megawatt. So we are uh, get a uh, uh, good data to the, uh, Realize our day. So, as you know, well, so uh, COP twenty uh, first, we want to contribute uh, uh, using the OTEC technology. So, uh, we would like to uh, read the and uh, test the uh, development in U.S., uh, Hawaii, and Okinawa. To we try to contribute it to so, oh, many island uh, religion. So uh, we want to uh, using the both uh, 
achievement. We have uh, good data, extent demonstration data. We want to uh, join it to one megawatt plus technical and uh, commercial uh, validation. So together we can uh, we can lead the world in the uh, ocean renewable energy uh, provided power 24 and 7. So finally, uh, this figure drawn by uh, Gaisan. Uh, at the beginning of the workshop, uh, we are discussed, uh, uh, many discussed uh, how to realize the OTE. So this uh, figure, uh, uh, Gaisan concept, OTE hydrogen test project, uh, Japan technology, so we are type Typing uh, using this video uh, uh, we typing. So uh, OTEC and hydrogen project and island model. Uh, Japan turbine hydrogen generation, metal generation to uh, joint it US. So uh, OTEC and uh, hydrogen. So tech for Okinawa, Okiden, fuel cell, we cut. So already uh, installed the hydrogen in Nelha. So next step, we want to realize a one megawatt OTEC and hydrogen uh, using the Geyser concept. So this workshop, we want to uh, realize a, uh, advanced uh, step, uh, sustainable island model and uh, showcase for the world. We are, until now, we are many discussion. So we have to start it from the vision to the action. Thank you for the attention. says that in the year 1999, 20 years henceforth, 
there would be 10,000 megawatts to OPEC. And as you know, today, net positive is zero, even though we have these two experiments. Um, hydrogen has not gone anywhere either. And so I just want to say I'm not a total failure because I was part of a group that put together the first wind bill. And it turns out that today, wind power is, is cheaper than a new coal or nuclear plant. So wind power has gone a long way. And if you were to compare PV with wind, wind is half the price of PV today. So you can see how attractive that option is. Um, so um, after I came back to Hawaii uh, in 1982, Paul you and the new dean and I thought, let's create our own funding agency. And, and we did with a lot of help from Governor Ariyoshi and President Fudd Matsuda and the, both Senators Inoue Matsunaga, Akaka in the House, called the Pacific International Center for High Technology Research. And in the mix of what was happening, uh, Senator Matsunaga talked to President Reagan about OTEC and working with Japan. And when Reagan went to Japan, he worked out with Nakasone an agreement to support Picture and use OTEC as the key foremost um, project to uh, support. And it turned out that Japan provided about a third of the $25 million we got to build uh, the open cycle plant that you saw, the, the, the base anyway, at, at uh, Nelva yesterday. Um, once, once we knew the money was coming, I went around the world and hired Lloyd Trimble from Lockheed and Andy Trenka, who was in Colorado, and Luis Vega and um, Gerard Niehaus. Uh, they had a small company in Berkeley. Uh, in Japan, Steve Masutani was working for Hitachi. So I brought him to Hawaii, and they're the ones who built that 255 kilowatt um, open cycle. And the reason why open cycle was selected is because fresh water is an important byproduct and there is no secondary fluid. So there's no ammonia problem. And so no one has done open cycle since then. So I think it's something you wanna consider. It's, it's less efficient, but you know, there's some pluses to that. Um, in the process of doing it, in 1992, this project actually got started at, at Kiowale Point. But in that year, a couple of other things happened, which will lead to why I think we're having this meeting today here. Um, Richard Matsuura, who was a state senator and who had worked in the Green Revolution for Norman Bolog, and I put together the first paper on the Blue Revolution. And this was presented at a, 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 a deep sea uh, platform, uh, international forum. And um, that led to um, a whole series of meetings with, which, which ultimately came to the point where in our second Okinawa-Hawaii meeting, um, the guy Toyama and I decided, why don't we create something to build an offshore system? And this resulted in the Pacific International Ocean Station, a $1.5 billion adventure that um, uh, we have done a lot. Now, God passed away, as you know, in the meantime, but that group is existing. And the same characters get involved, Matsuda, Ariyoshi, and so forth. Um, the, the question then is, where did you get $1.5 billion? It's not gonna come from government. It's not gonna be supplied by industry. It has to come from, and I'm sorry it's not here, billionaires. Uh, you need the right, person who uh, wants a legacy and and the next frontier for economic development is not space. I'm sure um, a lot of these billionaires will, will not agree with me like uh, like Musk. But um, it's it's the ocean. And and what it is is that um, imagine this platform, upwelling fluids, which you release into the ocean. It'll create a nutrient base if you can keep it in, in, in the euphoric zone. Uh, you can have next generation um, marine biomass plantations. Uh, you could have perhaps uh, the ultimate ocean ranch. 
And one of the projects they had with uh, Sun Yat-sen University in Taiwan, because they had a big aquarium that had a whale shark. Mind you, a whale shark is not a whale, it's a shark. And one whale shark, and these are, were up to 40 feet, but uh, one whale shark mother produces several hundred babies. So can you imagine someday an ocean, the ultimate ocean ranch of whale sharks um, to replace beef? And uh, so we looked at that and we thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, I've never had whale shark, but uh, it, it, it is needed. Uh, so in 1992 also, something called Green Endotopia was formed, and this is a group around the world who decided to pick islands where we should focus uh, for renewable energy. And um, Miyakojima was, was selected for Japan, and, and today if you ever go to Miyakojima, off of now, um, the main island, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of every book, but also Kumejima came up in the discussion for, for OTEC, and to some degree, uh, that led in that direction because the universe kind of begins things. So eventually working closely with the DDD director and, and the energy coordinator, people like um, uh, Sage Inaya and Maurice Skaya and eventually Mark Glick, uh, this meeting was formed. And uh, Mark Glick incidentally is not with DBD anymore a year ago. He moved to the University of Hawaii, and of all the interesting developments, his office is right next to mine on campus. Uh, I'm the only person I know in the world who's been retired from university for 17 years but still have an office on campus. So Mark is next to me in case you want to find him to follow up on, on, on these discussions. So um, that's where we're headed. You know, we're headed to a time, I hope, when ocean thermal energy conversion can be the heart of a floating platform that would be the blue revolution. And not only will you get products like hydrogen and um, uh, aquaculture, uh, electricity will be used for a range of things, not only to, to supply your homes, but it's going to be way out in the ocean there somewhere, uh, probably at the equator actually, because no hurricanes pass through the equator. Uh, and um, the key difference with, with the Blue Revolution is that while coal is bad and solar energy is net neutral, we might be able to enhance the environment with the Blue Revolution because with the upwelling, it, it, we might have to add a little iron, but you can suck up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to remediate global warming. And these platforms will be placed at the warmest portions of the ocean. And, and we've done a couple of studies that show that maybe we can prevent the formation of, of um, typhoons and hurricanes. So here we have a concept that's ideal for the future of humanity. And you are all important because you will build the OTEC plant that will do this. And, and this is what the Pacific International Ocean Station needs. We need two things. We need $1.5 billion, and we need the OTEC technology. So that's the past, and that's the future of why you're here today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Takahashi. I only regret we don't have whale shark on today's lunch menu. Um, but that was extremely interesting. At this time, we're going to shift um, to take a look at um, economic development and tourism. And leading us off is a guy who's worked uh, extremely hard at making this workshop and symposium, uh, bringing it together and hosting it. Please welcome Ross Birch. Executive Director of the Hawaii Island Visitors Bureau. Give me a second here to bring up the presentation.
Aloha and good morning. Ohio Yes, as John mentioned. As John mentioned, we are switching gears a little bit here. We uh, tourism does have a little tie to economic development and also tie to the uh, sustainability and conservation of the island as well. And more and more so, as we create sustainable tourism, we're creating sustainable entities that work around it, and it's our way to actually educate our tourists on all the great things we do on the island and throughout the state as well. I'm gonna explain a little bit how we operate as an organization, how we work, how we tie into the state, and how we make sure that we have visitors still coming to the islands, and they're coming in droves from all over the world. Our organization, the Island of Hawaii Visitor Bureau, um, is a island chapter, one of the chapters of all the different islands that's a subset of the Hawaii Visitor Convention Bureau. They're also known as Hawaii Tourism USA now, under the umbrella of Hawaii Tourism Authority. So we work directly for them, mainly on the U.S. market, and 85% of the visitors traveling to the island of Hawaii are from the U.S. mainland. 85% of the U.S. mainland visitors coming from the west coast between Seattle and San Diego. So we really have a core base group of where most of our travelers are coming from. So. Our main focus is still on that area. Like anyone who's a fisherman, you go fish where the fish are, it's much easier. So we focus a lot of our efforts in that area. And then as you can see, we have partnerships around the world. Hawaii Tourism Authority has contractors in all the major market areas of the world. And one of our big focuses on this island is the Japan market as well. It is our largest international market and it's growing day by day as well now that we have direct access back into the uh, Ellison Onizuka Kona International Airport. I have a very small team of eight individuals all together, including myself. We're based here on the west side of the island. I have an office at the Manalani Resort, and I have individuals that really head up different sectors. I have one that takes care of international and the group or CMI market. I have an individual that does the marketing and public relations. And then I have um, subsidiary sales individuals that really focus on the U.S. mainland market directly. Travel agents, wholesalers, and those who feed the market to come into the state. We use a lot of different assets in order to get our message out there to entice people to come to the island. And I didn't mention it early on, but I do have one of the best jobs that anybody can have. To entice someone to come to Hawaii and to come to an island is not very hard. It's just being in key places at the right time. And we use these assets to help us send our message out there. So every year we refresh and we create a vacation planner that's available in print and online. We have maps that are updated every year. We keep those fresh. And then we do sales pieces that kind of entice them, give about uh, 10 bullet points on the reasons why you would need to travel or would want to travel to the island. And then we also have video or te television commercials that play in the U.S. mainland market. We went to the island of Hawaii to look at the stars, hoping to make a big discovery. Did we make one? I'm guessing we made a few. video or this this commercial is running in a 30 and 60 second version and we actually use a lot of the different assets we use from the scientific side from our cultural side and from um, the sustainability to and it's more of an education piece it's, it's the father son bonding while they're learning about all the great things that the island has to offer and how it's maintained now who are we trying to attract to be a visitor to the island 
You would think we're trying to attract anybody and everybody to come to the island, which in some sense we are. Our key focus is in the four different major categories of the type of travel. We've narrowed it down to the avid traveler is our key customer. The avid traveler is someone that usually has a passport, someone that makes at least one to two trips a year, and someone that's in a certain financial bracket that allows them the, the availability to travel to Hawaii. So we kind of narrow it down in a demographic that way, but we use different assets to attract different types of travel. So someone who's enticed by uh, cultural history, they're more experiential, they're looking for these experiences and they want to really engage in the area that they are. So we have a culture traveler and we use assets tied into our cultural side to bring those visitors here. The golf traveler, that's a pretty obvious one. That's the reason why we try to attract the golf travelers, not necessarily through the golf assets, but to entice them to come on a golf vacation. The golf traveler fits the demographic very well. Also, they're more traveled, they're more experiential. They will play golf during their vacation, but it's not really the, the main priority of the vacation. So they're that type of individual we're looking to bring to the island. Outdoor recreation travel. This is one that our island fits up very well to. The outdoor recreation traveler is someone that is attractive because the availability and expansiveness of the experiences we have on the island are very easy to attract them to come here. And then other is kind of the catch-all. So you always have to have a room for romance. We're definitely a great place for honeymoons or weddings. And also the multi-generational family vacation is kind of fits into that romance and the family. We also dabble a little bit in the health and wellness, LGBT and culinary visitor. So there's a lot of events we have on island that we showcase and we utilize them to entice the culinary traveler as well. Now here's some statistics as we're getting into the state here. So it's over an 80 billion, it brings 80 billion to the economy, the combination of tourism and military to the state. Uh, for the first four months of the year, we brought in $657 million in tax revenues through the tourism. And this is a 10% increase over last year for the same period of time. So it's definitely still growing in great numbers. On our island specifically, our the tourism industry enables 14,400 jobs on the island, uh, which is about one-fifth of our uh, total jobs, and it's our largest economy on the island. Our visitor arrivals uh, at the end of April for the first four months of the year are 12.5% up year over year. Or, and the previous year, last year, we had 1.55 uh, million visitors which is only 50,000 less than our all-time high of 1.6. If we continue on this pace through the end of this year, we're gonna hit 1.75, which is far exceeding actually our all-time high of visitor arrivals to the island. And then the total spend, so we're up 20% in the total spend. So not only are we getting more visitors, they're spending even more money when they come here, which is great and they're getting a great experience. Like, how many went to the Luau last night? Did everybody have a great experience there? That's what we're trying to do. Is those are the great experiences, and, it, and it's well worth the expenses that we have to get these experiences. So we do have some improvements. As, as we grow in tourism, we're expanding, and we need to continually to improve our uh, facilities and one of those is our Kona Airport. Kona Airport is the largest small airport in the state. We have 8,000 visitors per day, not just visitors, but locals as well. So there's 8,000 individuals that are passing through this airport, which was created originally to handle 500,000 on an annual basis. So we're running 3 million people through Kona Airport that originally was constructed for 500,000. So currently we're under a $75 million expansion or a improvement, which will make the flow of those three, three million individuals much easier in the process, a lot better. We're still gonna remain a nice, quaint, 
island airport where you still will not exit off onto a jetway. It will still be that island experience, so you'll come off the stairs or off of a ramp, even into the renovation period. They're going through that process because even our lift is at an all-time high ever coming into the island. We have more seats. This past year we had over 950,000 seats coming into Kona Airport, where three years ago we had 625,000 seats. We're continuing to add more and more lift. Part of that is Japan Airlines announced on September 15th they will start daily service from Narita Airport into Kona. They're flying a 767-300, which has about 195 seats on it. So we're going to see about an additional 75,000 seats per year coming in on Japan Airlines. United Airlines just made an announcement as well. They're running daily flights now from Denver into Kona, and they're also increased another additional daily from LA and another daily from San Francisco. So yes, we're stacking airplanes on top of airplanes on top of airplanes. That's a great thing about not having jetways is we can park them anywhere and people can get off and on. So that allows us to expand without going through that major uh, renovation at this, at this point. So it's all great news on the lift side and, and we're moving forward and continuing to, to entice new different areas to come in. So Japan allowed us to open the access internationally. We're also looking at different entities uh, coming from Korea, from China, from other countries, even uh, Oceania, could be looking at coming direct into Kona as well. So we do tie our tourism into the sustainability, and we try to use our assets to promote the great sustainable assets on the island. Uh, this is a video that we produced. Uh, each year we go through and we work with a local television company. And not just to our tourists, but it's also an educational piece to our local residents. So we uh, have KHON, which is a local TV station, come over and do vignettes of some of our areas on the island that will help entice some of our local residents from neighbor islands. But they're also going to send a message to those visitors who are on Oahu and Maui to say maybe your next time while you're visiting Hawaii, you can come check out some of these things. with an octopus on Hawaii Islands, and you don't need any scuba gear or even a swimsuit. I didn't even know this existed. Trini, visit the Kalawa Octopus Farm in Kailua Kona and learn about its important mission. We are in Kona at the state's only octopus farm, Kanaloa Octopus Farm. Now we're here with the owner, Jacob. Uh, Jacob, tell us about your business and what inspired you to open an octopus farm. Well, um, what we're trying to do here is try to figure out how to raise octopuses in captivity. Um, I've really been a fan of aquaculture and um, that we can raise these animals on land instead of having to go out into wild to harvest them. And octopus aquaculture is pretty important due to overfishing. Um, you know, the, the problems with overfishing is pretty localized throughout the world, so there's quite a few populations that are doing great, uh, but it really has to do with the culture that they are next to. So, uh, California, people don't really fish for octopus too much, but over here in Hawaii and, you know, places in Asia, uh, we fish for it pretty heavily. Um, so, if we can raise them uh, sustainably and offer some sustainable seafood as opposed to wild Yeah, is it a problem here in Hawaii? Um, here in Hawaii, you know, fishermen fish for them with pretty sustainable fishing methods. Um, they go out and uh, catch them singly, by hand, or with a spear. So it's definitely the most sustainable form of fishing. Um, however, there is some evidence that uh, populations are declining here in Hawaii. Uh, anecdotally, uh, you'll ask some of the old fishermen, and they say that the populations uh, are declining, and they see a lot less octopus in that way. Mm -hmm. So tell us about what you do here, because you do a lot of research on the premises. Yeah, so this is really all about research. We're trying to figure out how to raise them in captivity. Um, really all the commercially important species of octopuses haven't been figured out. Um, these are uh, octopuses that have a very small larval stage. And this is really, really difficult to keep alive. They require a very small and specific type of food uh, called plant. Okay, and you've been doing this for just over a year? Yes, about a year and three months. Okay, so how is your research funded? Um, our research is funded 100% through tourism. We allow people to come in and look at the research that we're already doing, and uh, that funds our research. Okay, so 
do you do 10 tours a day? Yes, two tours, one at 10 a.m. and one at 2 p.m. Okay, so I encourage everybody to come on down, check this out. Uh, coming up on Living Gateway, I'm going to get up close and personal with an octopus because I heard they're pretty friendly, right? Yes, very friendly. <laughs> okay, can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. Kanaloa yeah. yeah. is uh, the, the god of the ocean, god of sea. Oh, yeah, so maybe that's how we get it. But also Kanaloa, when you, when you talk about Kanaloa, the god. So did you hear when he said he's completely funded by tourism? That's why we do these things. And that this piece was over five minutes long on the news. It sits on the website. It's out there continuously. You can go um, check it out on, on KHON and all of our partners there. But it, it was our ability to give back, make the buy for them so that they could get the information of what they do out to the rest of the state, kind of get a little bit more awareness of all the different things that are going on right at Nelva. And we are, we had the opportunity last night. We ran into a celebrity from Kumajima who's going to be in our very next video in the Japan market. <laughs> Thank you, Ross. The one um, image that was missing was his latest golf scorecard. Ross is also, also a zero handicap uh, golfer, so he has a perfect job representing our island. Um, science tourism found its biggest advocate and champion when they found our next presenter. She is the executive director of Friends of Nelha. Please welcome Candy Ellsworth. Friday, sometimes on the weekends, 
And um, I educate children from Hawaii, also educate uh, children from all over the world and university groups, school groups, and then the regular everyday tourists. And so last year we had over 6,000 visitors come through Guam. And so why is this so important? And we have this great niche here in, on our island, but also at NOHA. And it's a really important role that I fulfill at NOHA. Science education. We really need more science literacy here in, in our state but we need it all over the world. So science literacy, why does science matter? So what is science literacy? According to the United States National Center for Educational Statistics, science literacy is the knowledge and understanding of scientific, scientific concepts and processes required for personal decision making, participation in civic and cultural affairs, and economic productivity. Now, it involves all of these things that are listed here, I'm not gonna read them all, but they're all very important and they sound really technical. Things like how to formulate a scientific question, how to observe and set up uh, experiments, and how to analyze that data, and things like this. Now, it looks, the list looks very technical, but really, children are born with this. It's an it's innate. And then we kind of squeeze it all out of them. I'm gonna give you an example. So, when I was about seven years old, about that time. I was running around at night playing tag with some of my friends. I realized I was watching lightning bugs. Now I don't condone this behavior in Kumajima because you have an endangered lightning bug. <laughs> <laughs> and I do not encourage the um, mutilation or torture of any insect or animal. But I was seven and I thought, wow, these things are glowing. I wonder what would happen if I smeared them on my legs and arms. So I did, and I glowed, and I ran around, and it was really fun. And it, I think that it was kind of morbid, and my mother was probably shocked and horrified, but she did not say anything. Uh, I developed some empathy for insects later on. Uh, it's one of the things that I'm most well known for. I'm a biologist, conservation biologist, and the top two things that I worked with were insects and snakes. So. Um, but what I was really doing is I was observing the world around me. I was thinking and formulating questions. I did an experiment. I ran around. I saw the results of my experiment. So clearly I was a prodigy at seven. <laughs> I was obviously a genius. So, but you know, my mother wasn't going, that's so gross. Oh, you have to go wash. You're gonna make a mess. You're gonna get that on your clothes. You know, she didn't say that. She just probably thought, oh God, what am I gonna do with this girl? What is she even going to end up being? So, you know, my point is that children do this every day. They're observing the world around them. They're coming up with weird experiments. Maybe they flush something strange down the toilet. They wanna see what happens when they do that. <laughs> and so, you know, these little experiments, they matter. And so, you know, that's what I'm trying to say. These, this list looks very technical, but it's not really. Kids are born with this, and we need to encourage it. Now, why is this important? A recent study just this past year said that in the state of Hawaii, relating to our ACT scores, only 11% of Hawaii students are meeting the benchmark for science, technology, engineering, and math of 26 in 2016, so last year. That's a, that's a really uh, scary thing. Children need more experiences. They need to be encouraged more in this area of science and technology and engineering and math. And so why is it so important nowadays? We're living in this world where children and adults, we're all confronted with it too, are confronted every single day with these misconceptions, our new word, our new fun word, alternative facts, um, fear and confusion, uncertainty about the future, and it's really scary. You know, kids are constantly getting this message. We're getting it all the time, and it's, it's depressing enough. But think about kids that don't have the tools to, to cope with this. And so science literacy gives, empowers children with the ability to combat these issues and to think about them and, and plan and empower them to address these, these uh, questions that have to do with our future, right? 
So energy independence, food security, all the things that we've been talking about. Clean water availability. We're here on this island, in Kumajima, you're on an island. You know, we have, we have issues that need to be solved. The ancient Hawaii, the, the nation of Hawaii, uh, once sustained about a million people. And they did that without any outside influence. And we have about 1.3 million today. We should be able to do that sustainably. And so why is this so important here? And we've heard this for the past few days. So Hawaii was the first state to sign the Paris Agreement. Hawaii County was the first, and then the state, to join BLISPA, making this commitment towards a better future. So um, John already talked about this yesterday, about island, small island nations. We stand to suffer the worst of climate change, and we contribute the least to it. So this is really important. Necessity drives innovation. And we are in times where innovation is a necessity. So I've worked on islands most of my professional career, uh, mostly in the Caribbean. And one of the things that I learned was that people on islands are more resourceful. And they're more resourceful because they have to be. They're forced to be. So people on continents should be thinking of themselves as living on large islands. But they don't because those resources are there, they're available. What does it matter? We have so much of it, we can't use it all. You know, and that was one of the things, being on small islands, I, I saw a lot of um, in, inventions that <laughs> were hilarious sometimes. I, I uh, often saw how many large objects could be carried on a moped in uh, the Dominican Republic, and along with a family of four or five. It was very interesting. I have some fun pictures. I should have thrown those in here today. Um, but my point is, is that the rest of the world needs to become like small islands. And we need our children to think like this. We need to train them to think like this. We need to make science fun. We need to make it look cool. We need, we need to make it look accessible. We need, you know, when I, when I take a lot of school groups around, Melha, and we walk around and we go to OTEC, and one of the engineers comes outside, and they're, they're wearing their slippers and their board shorts and their sunglasses. I say to all the kids, look, that's an engineer. That's what an engineer looks like. And they all laugh and they think that's so funny. But that's putting something in their mind. These aren't people running around in a lab coat. They're not wearing their steel toed shoes and they're reading. They don't look boring. They look fun. These are scientists. These are engineers. These are the people that you know have these exciting careers. We want children to see that. We want them to picture themselves in that role. We want them to think about that. Wow, I want to do that. That looks like so much fun. He's feeding a big giant fish squid. I want to do that. You know, and I always ask the people too when we have school groups. I'll say, you know, we're at Compachi, and I'll say, Darren, where did you go to school? And he'll say, Oh, I went to you know Hilo Community College, and I got a you know, and then I graduated with a master's degree, and I I grew up here, you know, and. And, and the engineers at and Mackay Ocean Engineering, most of them went to UH um, Manal. And so I want that in the, in the minds of those kids. Wow, I can live here. I can have these exciting careers. And that's what we need. We need those children to see that. We need to see, they need to see them play themselves in that place. Um, and we need to, for them to see that it's here. They don't have to go elsewhere. So now has a great example of science in action. We tour people around. I do a presentation in the morning, and then we take the kids out to different places. But I want to add, I'm not just working with kids. I'm working with adults from all over the world, right? Monday through Friday, visitors from everywhere. So we have a global reach. That little span of time that I have with them, I can make a difference. And that difference can go to the rest of the world. And so that's very important, not just for children, but science and action. People addressing real world problems and needs through innovation and research. NELHA is a perfect example of this. The origination of NELHA, one of the ideas was to spur economic development, right? And, and that's one of the things that, that they've been able to do, but also to have community outreach and education. And so NELHA provides examples for young people of human innovation and not giving up. Science is about trial and error. You guys all know this. How long has OTEC been going on for years and years and years? Did you give up because it was hard? Did you give up when something failed? You don't. And you want kids to know this. You want them to know that it, they have a safe place to fail. 
Because failing is important. You need to make mistakes. You figure out how to do things better. As, is, and as scientists, you share those mistakes and you all learn from them. That's one of the reasons that we have this great partnership and this, this, um, this great synergy between our two islands. We're able to talk about these things and what worked for you and what didn't work for you. So we encourage them not to be afraid to try or fail. Also inquiry, asking questions and testing ideas, experiences provided at NELHA can inspire and empower young minds of what's possible for them and also their futures. And finally, we've also been reminded of this on um, the past couple days, the Hokalea, the return of the Hokalea. And I don't know if any of you had a chance to watch uh, the homecoming last Saturday, but the speech by Nyan Miller Thompson is one of the most powerful, inspirational speeches I've ever heard. And I think I've watched it about six times already. <laughs> and I think I'll continue to watch it for inspiration. But one thing that he said in that speech was, you can't protect what you don't understand. You won't if you do not care, and you cannot do it alone. So we cannot do this alone. We need the children of the future. They are a future. Sounds cliche, but it's true. They are a future. And we need for them to be empowered and engaged and inspired. And we need for them to be the next generation that's sitting in this room. So with that, I thank you so much uh, for, for listening to uh, my little portion. <laughs> for being here. I had the great honor last year of uh, being in Kumajima, and you guys welcomed me so much. Uh, I felt like family, and now I get to see you all again this year, and I'm so excited, and um, I'm, I'm really happy for this, um, this partnership, and I hope it grows and, um, and expands with education, and, and speaking with some of the people from Kumajima, but that relationship between the students on the two islands is wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Candy. Uh, the County of Hawaii has the Department of Research and Development, which is responsible for stimulating and catalyzing growth in specific sectors in the economy, to include tourism agriculture, renewable energy, science and technology, as well as cultivate small business and entrepreneurial endeavors. And we're fortunate to have the department director at this time. Please welcome Diane Lay. <laughs> <laughs> 